All right, we're going to pick up in this session in uh, the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. Now, I've mentioned in the past I'd like to take a little bit of time for review to reestablish context of what we're talking about. So let's do that. I've got some notes here I'd like to just refer to. We've got to be reminded that the book of Acts covers about 35 years of history. It takes us from approximately 30 to 65 AD. It's primarily an historical book, and uh, there are several different kinds of transitions that we've noted. Probably the primary tran transition is from the ministry of Christ to the ministry of his disciples, the apostles, but we would also uh, look at that in this uh, context, Old Testament to New Testament, Israel to the church, the kingdom to the body of Christ, Jews to Jews, and ultimately the majority of the ministry was to Gentiles. Peter, the leadership of Peter in the first 12 chapters, to the leadership of the Apostle Paul in the remainder of the book, the book starting out, centering in the city of Jerusalem where Christ was crucified, where he ascended into heaven, and uh, we move in chapter number 13 to the city of Antioch, Antioch of Syria, and it's from that city that Paul and Barnabas are originally commissioned to go to uh, the uttermost part of the earth. So th this gives us just a little bit of a background. Uh, from chapters 13 through 28, there are five major themes or events that take place. Three of them are Paul's missionary journeys. Then uh, we looked at, uh, also in chapter 15, we looked at the uh, Council of Jerusalem. And uh, then the final portion of the book, or the remainder of the book, after the third missionary journey, deals with uh, Paul's uh, arrest and then his appeal to Caesar he travels to Rome to appear before Caesar, and then we understand, we believe that uh, Paul was martyred at some point after the 28th chapter of Acts. So that gives us just a little bit of a reference point of what we're doing. We're in chapter number 18 right now. Uh, I'm on page 219 of our notebook, and uh, if you look at the top of that page, I've entitled this, Strength Training for the Disciples. And Basically, what I see is different ways in which the disciples were strengthened uh, in their ministry. Challenges always have a tendency either to do one of two things, to destroy us or to make us better. So hopefully we uh, rise to the occasion. Of course, the disciples did rise to many occasions. It's through, their, uh, through the obstacles that they face faced, uh, we saw that they, rather than obstacles, they faced them as opportunities. That's the way certainly Paul the Apostle was. That's the way other disciples were throughout the book of Acts. So we see at the top there an outline for Acts chapter 18, Paul and his friends, his fruit, his father. That's a reference to God the Father, his foes. And then he sails to Ephesus and to Antioch at the end of chapter number 18. So this is the conclusion of Paul's second missionary journey. We saw the first missionary journey in chapters 13, 14, uh, and uh, then in chapter 15, the Council at Jerusalem, and then he begins his thir third missionary journey there in chapter 15, and here in chapter 18, that journey will be concluded. We've given you some approximate dates, and they are, we remind you that these are approximate. They're within a couple years, maybe right on the button, but within a couple years. We know, also noted that uh, Paul's first trip was about a 900-mile journey in chapters 13 and 14. However, this is a 2,800-mile, almost three times the length, well, three times the length of Paul's first missionary journey. There's some familiar names that show up, like uh, Corinth, Ephesus, Galatia. There were epistles written by Paul to all of these places. There's some familiar names that we'll see, and uh, a focus on discipleship. And right from the beginning of this study, we talked about this. 
we said that what we want to do is we want to study the disciples. We want to study how, uh, what their priorities were, how they conducted their ministry, their methodologies, the kind of character that these people possessed. And of course, all along the way, there are certain Christian doctrines that are taught over and over again in establishing what Christianity really is all about. Uh, Christianity primarily is about Christ, obviously, and the key doctrine of Christianity, the death, the burial, and ultimately the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The gospel is relatively simple, and it's by grace through faith, not of yourselves. Salvation comes to an individual by believing the Bible, what the Bible says about you, what the Bible says about him, and what the Bible says about sin, and what the Bible says that Jesus Christ has done for all of us. So let's pick up our reading here. We're going to go uh, to chapter 18, bottom of page 219, in verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. Notice the parentheses, the reason why they came, because that Claudius, the emperor of Rome, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. We've mentioned this in the past. The Jews uh, had lots of uh, pushback. They, had, uh, they met lots of enemies, and they were not uh, appreciated wherever they went um, in the Roman Empire. And so they had, uh, we see here that actually they were expelled from Rome because they were troublemakers. Well, let's pick it up in verse 3. And because he was, excuse me, uh, let's go back to verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, and that Aquila, verse 3, because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation they were tent makers. They wrought. That means they worked together. They got to know each other through their vocation. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. That's the center of the message to the Jews. And when they opposed themselves, they were arguing among themselves and blasphemed he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. So Paul left Athens and traveled to Corinth. He was, uh, this was about a 53-mile walk. That had to take a couple days for sure. Athens had been known as the ancient capital of Greece. We looked at them back in chapter 17. But, uh, but for all practical purposes, Corinth had become the center of trade and commerce, and that was because of its geographical location, and the explanation of that follows. Corinth was a cosmopolitan city with a highly unsettled and transient population, kind of like uh, the, the big cities in America today, like uh, New York City. Of course, there are many people that live there and permanently live there. But New York is a transient city. People are coming and going from all over the world because it is such a business capital of the world. Corinth, in a much smaller sense, was a place very much like New York. We've put in our notes that it was probably like uh, uh, the city of Las Vegas, although Las Vegas was really built on gambling and entertainment and the like. Corinth was not. It was built on commerce and trade. But uh, much like Las Vegas is one of those places, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Corinth, and we know this from reading the epistles that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, we know that Corinth had a lot of uh, worldly issues that they had to deal with. The book of 1 Corinthians was written by Paul and was composed in Ephesus, and we'll see that a little bit later on, during his stay there, which is recorded in the 19th uh, chapter, in our, in our next chapter in our study. If you'll notice in your notebook, there about the middle of that page 220, there are in parentheses 
There is a, a statement, map of Corinth. Uh, there is a set of PowerPoint uh, uh, displays that goes along with this whole series. There's about 500 different PowerPoints. Now, it's not practical to show them on video and, and the way we're doing this, but if I were to teach this class live, then I would uh, be able to, you wouldn't have to see, you wouldn't have to focus on me, obviously. Uh, you would be able to uh, focus on a screen and me both at the same time. And uh, we have chosen not to do this uh, in this study. This is kind of our maiden voyage with uh, the teaching in the book of Acts. But there is a series of about 500 PowerPoint presentations that go right along with this series of, of 40, 41, 42 messages. So um, we've made some comments there. Uh, Luke uh, is a historian. Wisely, he talks about various cities, locations, events, and individuals. And I say wisely because when he does that, what he does is he, val he validates the authority or the authenticity of the book of Acts. There are many individuals who are mentioned that we can trace back into history, like Claudius right now, and who he was and what he did and when he did it historically, that validates and puts some of the pieces together in the book of Acts for us. So we know that this isn't just um, you know, a novel that someone wrote, a fairy tale, a pipe dream and somebody just wrote a bunch of stuff down to you know to, to meet a publisher's requirement to make some money uh, by producing uh, some kind of piece of some piece of literature. Luke was a historian and he documents um, much of what is said by talking about the people, the places, the events that surrounded also the events that were taking place here. The term craft that uh, you probably figured that out. That's basically their occupation. In verse number four, we read again, Paul, he goes to the synagogue. We've listed several places. And notice the et cetera at the end. Paul never lost his love for the Jewish people. Wherever he went, he went and uh, sought them out and sought to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ. They opposed themselves. They argued among themselves. That's a King James way of saying that. And then that final comment under 18.6, your blood be upon your own he uh, heads, that imagery is, uh, shows up in other places in the Bible. The idea is simply this, that uh, when you fail to warn someone of impending doom and uh, through neglect, laziness, maybe just out of revenge, whatever, whatever your motive or whatever your reason, the blood of that person is then figuratively speaking on your hands. You are in a sense killing them or injuring them and you are guilty. That's the meaning of your blood be upon your hands. So pick it up in verse 7, the bottom of 220. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. That is, it was right next door, joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So good things uh, are happening here. There's certainly opposition, as uh, we have mentioned. There's no question about that. But at the same time, the gospel is making headway. People are listening. Uh, Jewish people are listening in this case. And many of them are coming to know Christ is their Messiah. Crispus, who is mentioned here in verse number 8, actually shows up again in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse uh, 14. I did note also where it says that they believed and were baptized. It appears that there is essentially no delay between 
the profession of faith or the acceptance of Christ as Savior, and people followed baptism immediately. Uh, they didn't go through baptismal classes or confirmation classes or whatever you want. Now, by the way, I'm not opposed to making sure that people understand what it means to be saved. But I believe as quickly as we possibly can, once we know that to be a fact, within reason, when we know that to be a fact, we ought to try to encourage people to be baptized. Verse number 9 of chapter 18, Then spake the Lord to Paul, in the night by a vision. Uh, the Lord uh, used several visions in Paul's life to speak to him. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Uh, much people in the city, that is, there were people who were already believers and uh, uh, possibly and uh, Paul was relatively safe staying here because there was a, a good contingency of believers that would protect him. And then another way of looking at that is that God in his omniscience knew that there were many people in that city who would come to know Christ as Savior. The fact of the matter is that's probably true of any city or any big city. We believe that there were approximately 250,000 people uh, that lived in Corinth at this time. And if, um, you know, 1% of those people came to know Christ as Savior, that's a, a pretty good uh, group of people. That's 2,500 people right there, just 1% of that. 10% it would be 25,000 people uh, that would uh, ultimately except Christ as Savior. So there were many or much people in this city. So he stayed there for a year and a half, teaching the Word of God. Yeah, may have, in a sense, opened up a little Bible institute there. Knowing Paul, he probably didn't have one class per week either for an hour and a half. He was probably teaching God's Word uh, every day, maybe several times a day during this period of time, establishing believers. There's a passage of Scripture in Timothy that is so vital that explains the procedure or process of discipleship. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we read, And the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul says to Timothy, among many witnesses, the same Commit thou, Timothy, to faithful men, a third generation, who shall be able to teach others also, a fourth generation. So the whole concept, the whole idea of discipleship is spelled out in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Someone taught me. It is my responsibility to teach someone else and to teach someone else well enough that they will be and inspire them that they will be able to teach another generation of believers. Now, if you just stop for a moment, you look at the calendar and see what year it is. This has been going on for a couple thousand, almost a couple thousand years now. So there are many generations of individuals who have done exactly that. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 2. How far you can go back in your genealogy personally, that is, who led you to Christ? Who discipled you? Who led that person to Christ? And who discipled him or her? And ad infinitum, if you please, keeping going back generation after generation. Who, uh, who told you know, the person that, you know, four or five generations ago. It'd be interesting if you could track all that down. I suppose you could if you really wanted to. Well, anyway, let's uh, pick things up here. I'm on page 221. I noted and mentioned before there were six visions that Paul received, and they are listed here uh, in the middle of page 221. They all came at crucial points in Paul's ministry, and um, the vision provides four reasons 
for Paul not to give up. And I think that we can identify with these, spiritually certainly apply them to ourselves. First of all, we have been told to speak. It's a commandment. Uh, going into all the world to preach the gospel is not an option. It's not something that we choose to do or choose not to do when we feel like it. It is a commandment that has been given to us as God's people, as Christians. He reminded him, secondly, he said, I am with thee. I will never leave you or forsake you. So we have a commandment. We have the presence of the Lord. And he made a promise to Paul that he would protect him and guard him. And that's true of all of us. Now we know that there is such a thing as martyrdom. Uh, we know, we saw that back in chapter number 12 when James lost his life, but Peter was spared and he escaped from prison. So God has an ultimate will and purpose for each and every one of us, but he promised protection to the apostle Paul here in verse number 10. And he also reminded him, there are a lot of people here that need your ministry. There are many people here uh, that need to hear what you know and to be taught by you. So Paul spends, uh, as we mentioned, as the text mentions, about a year and a half there. And we pick up in chapter 18 in verse number 12. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But this isn't a political or government issue. But if it be a question of words and names and your law, look ye to it. For I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of these things. So Gallio, who is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Roman who is in charge here at this particular place, he's the, uh, it, uh, the final authority here, he says, listen, I'm not interested in your theological or religious disputes. This is not my sphere of influence. This is not under my jurisdiction. You guys can argue all you want to about your religion. I don't see anything that you are disagreeing about here that has anything to do with me and my responsibility as a governor. He's a pretty smart guy, wasn't he? He certainly was. He appears to be much wiser than Pilate was, who, uh, then, who allowed the Jews to take Christ and ultimately crucify him. Gallio wasn't interested in their personal religious disputes. Frankly, the Jews were not high on the priority list of the Roman government. Claudius had expelled them from Rome because they were troublemakers. Verse 17, the Greeks took their anger and frustration out on the chief ruler of the synagogue right in front of Gallio. Their strategy, that is to, to get uh, Paul, etc., in trouble, it really backfired on them. So we see Sosthenes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 1, uh, and it appears that uh, he's called, and we assume that this is the same Soth Sosthenes, it says at the end of verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 1 that Sosthenes is our brother, our brother. Well, uh, God told Paul, he said, no man will hurt you. And Gallio, Gallio's decision freed Paul and freed the preaching of the gospel from legal, legal, excuse me, legal constraints all over the Roman um, Empire. It was a significantly uh, incredible uh, decision that was made here. 
and it was followed throughout the whole Roman Empire. All right, let's pick it up here in uh, chapter 18, verse number 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence, or from there, into Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. There he goes again. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. Again, good results here. But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. And again, we see in parentheses there a map. And we do have a PowerPoint map on that. In these final verses, we see some interesting thoughts that we will address uh, shortly. Christianity, the church, young Christians are in transition. The move from the early almost Jewish-only church to a much broader Gentile population has taken us now about 20 years. We're about approximately 50 AD or so. Old habits and ideas die slowly. The gospel is going to the uttermost part of the earth and God's people, Israel, have largely rejected Christ. But the gospel rolls on. We mentioned that uh, Paul has now spent about two and a half years on this mission journey, his second missionary journey, started back in chapter 15 and concludes here in chapter 18. And he will have traveled about 2,800 miles. 2,800 miles. There's some, several things here, I think, that uh, at the bottom of the page uh, and over into page number uh, 224 that we can take from this lesson. So let's, uh, let's take about five minutes. We'll look at some of them and we'll take a break, all right? Okay, uh, what can we take? Every major city in the world is becoming a Corinth, <laughs> I guess. That's where we need to start churches today, in big cities. Because in big cities, uh, big cities and their locations generally have influence or access to smaller uh, municipalities around them. Uh, you're going to find a larger group of people, obviously, and uh, the likelihood of growing a church a church that's not, able, not only able to support itself, but then to reach out to other communities, I think is far more likely. I think we need to go to major municipal locations to establish churches, cities. Now, I'm not going to establish a number on that, but, um, you know, a little town that's never been heard of in Pennsylvania is probably not the place, just because they don't have a church, doesn't mean that it requires a church. Uh, sometimes I hear, you know, I went to a, a, a young preacher traveling around uh, will say, you know, I went to this town and there's no Bible-believing church in the town. Well, it might be a town of 800 people and that may very well be true. But there are cities like, uh, like New York City or like Los Angeles or Miami or Atlanta or Kansas City or... Syracuse or whatever, Akron, Ohio. Now, I know there are churches in all of those places, but when you look at the concentration of population, uh, how many churches per capita are found in those places? And I believe that reaching the main cities is the key to reaching a county, a state. Well, anyway, we'll move on from that. It's imperative, as I said, that we establish strong churches in these places. Friends, converts, and our personal relationship with God all serve to strengthen us 
in the faith and encourage us in the work. Now, if you remember our title of this, let's go back to page 219, Strength Training for the Disciples. The first on page 219 is friendships bring strength. People attract people, and we need one another. Secondly, page 220, Paul and his fruit. When we see results, when we are productive, it encourages us to go further. The third thing that brings strength is encouragement from the Word of God, an encouragement from our Father. That's on page 221. And then we see even his foes, the fact that Paul met obstacles and opponents, that he even drew strength uh, during those times when he saw God work through the greatest challenges of his ministry, he knew he was doing the right thing. And of course, the chapter then concludes in our outline that we mentioned earlier that Paul sails to Ephesus and to Antioch. We note at the bottom of page number 223, the idea of being pure from the blood of all men. That's a quote from Acts chapter 20. We'll see that in not too distant future. But we picked up Ezekiel 3, Ezekiel 38, that talk about the great responsibility that we have to warn the wicked. And then on page uh, 224, kind of an outline of, of discipleship. What can be accomplished through biblical discipleship? Now, I've preached this message, and it's a, this is a portion of a message that I've preached in the past, but these are things that I believe can be accomplished through uh, discipleship, whether it's uh, uh, through a group, through a small group Bible study, probably even more effective one-on-one -on -one or couple-on-a-couple. -on -couple. What we do is we establish the new Christian in faith. We uh, offer comfort to people who are uh, new in their beliefs and comfort and that there are people who accept them and love them. Oftentimes when, when a person gets saved, they're rejected by people who are close to them. Protection, accountability, fellowship, spiritual growth, all of these things, uh, there's, uh, uh, you probably have illustrations of all of these things that you could speak about that are advantages of being involved in one-on-one um, -on -one discipleship uh, uh, with individuals. Either you have been advantaged yourself or you are helping others through their newfound faith. Well, uh, we've got uh, some other things there that are a little bit of a review at the bottom of page 224. But uh, I think what we'll do is we'll call this lesson right here. We'll come back and we'll look at uh, the remainder of chapter uh, number uh, 18. And that lesson is uh, an interesting lesson. Uh, I, I entitled it, It's What You Learn After You Know It All That Counts. And uh, we'll look into that in just a little bit. Okay, let's take a break right now.